The first writers in residence came to the James Merle House 25 years ago, shortly after James Merle's death in 1995. Since then, over 80 writers have visited, staying in his home, a National Historic Landmark, to work on projects of their own. Thanks to Merrill's generosity, the house now belongs to the Stonington Village Improvement Association and is an ongoing inspiration for writers and poets from around the world. For more information, visit our website, jamesmerrillhouse.org. Thank you. Hi, um, this is Willard Spiegelman. I'm speaking to you today from 107 Water Street. It's a pleasure to introduce our latest Merrill House Fellow, Walt Hunter, who is at the tail end of his month, a gloriously autumnal September of mists and mellow fruitfulness here in Stonington, who will talk to us about his work in the Merrill House on his new book on the American House Poem, from 1945 to 2015. I can think of no better place to consider this subject than the very apartment from which we are speaking to you this afternoon. By the way, it is the birthday of T.S. Eliot today. I thought I would let you know that. Also the birthday of George Gershwin. I don't think Walt will sing for us, however. But I can think of no scholar, critic, poet, translator, journalist, young man of letters, as well suited for such a vast undertaking as his new book, as Walt Hunter. A brief biography. He grew up in Philadelphia. He was graduated from Harvard College in 2004 with a summa cum laude degree. He studied there with Peter Sachs and Jory Graham, who were familiar to Stonington audiences, and who spirited Walt away with them to Normandy following graduation to work with them in France. He received his doctorate in English from the University of Virginia and has been teaching at Clemson University in South Carolina for the past nine years. The quality and quantity of his accomplishments are in inverse proportion to his age. He is that rare phenomenon in contemporary literary and academic life, a polyglot and a Renaissance man. With fluent French, good German, more than small Latin and Greek, plus a smattering of Spanish, Walt has written for both the general public and the scholarly community on poets as diverse as Robert Lowell, Jory Graham, Claude McKay, and many others uh, whom I know not, but whom I'm becoming familiar with, uh, even as I am losing my place on the screen. Just a moment. Um, in the past two years, he has contributed moving memorial pieces to the Atlantic on the late poets Donald Hall and W.S. Merwin. And there was also a wonderful piece he wrote, uh, a testimonial to studying with the late Harvard philosopher Stanley Cavell, whose lessons his student has been absorbing for almost two decades. Walt's first book, Forms of a World, Contemporary Poetry and the Making of Globalization, came out last year, and it tackles the immense and immensely unusual but necessary job of linking poets' styles to particular aspects of nationhood, globalization, and capital itself. His new book promises to be even more engaging, thinking of poets and their residences in the context of post-World War II real estate development. Walt writes sonnets. Walt translates. Walt is a nimble writer and a serious thinker, and these two things seldom go hand in hand. He's been inspired by the subjects of his studies and also by his passions, not only in how to treat them, but also how to emulate and internalize their examples. I think, for example, of his lovely tribute to Donald Hall and what Walt calls, I'm quoting him now, Hall's hospitable poems, which approach difficult ideas 
in the idioms of common speech and defend the sense and meaning of ordinary language from the daily barrage of a debased and weaponized English. Hospitable is exactly the right word for someone who is interested in how poets welcome us into the rooms of their houses and into the rooms of their poems. So it's a great pleasure now to introduce Walt, who will talk to us about his work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Willard. And if my blush isn't visible from your wonderful introduction, it's only because I'm out blushed by the flame um, color of the, of the walls behind me. Um, I'm very lucky to be here and I'm very fortunate to have had spent the month with Willard and with the members of the James Merrill House Committee who have shown me nothing but the most exquisite hospitality themselves at every moment. And um, so this, uh, this talk goes uh, along with an immense debt of gratitude that I have to them. The talk is called James Merrill's Open Houses. And what, what I'm going to do is look at some of the most beautiful of Merrill's poems, which also happen to be the ones uh, about, about houses. Uh, and then also at the very end, read a short poem that I wrote uh, while I was in the apartment. Living in James Merrill's house, uh, I kept asking myself the question, how do poems begin? This, this is probably a question that um, it's somewhat obvious when you're when you're inhabiting a writer's house. What makes a poem and how does it get from the imagination to the page? Uh, every room in Merrill's house offers a different clue to this process. There is, for instance, the hidden room where he wrote and revised, the walls filled with books of poetry. Here I found many American poets from the 1950s through the 1980s who were famous in their day uh, some of whom have slipped off reading lists, um, and also poets such as the Nobel, the Nobel Prize winning Greek poet George Seferis, and volumes of earlier poetry from Greek and Latin through modernists in French, English, and German. A very capacious and Catholic taste Merrill had. There's also the upper studio and deck with stunning panoramas of the sound outside, built as much for composing poems as for convening friends. I found myself writing this, I found myself writing this talk outside on the deck in the cool September weather. And perhaps most famously, there's the dining room with the Ouija board, a third source for Merrill's poetry, and a third place where the poetic imagination for him and for us took flight. These three rooms in the house, the study, the deck outside, the flaming dining room, are not just magical places to write. They also hold three different stories about how poetry might get written. First, by sifting the words of earlier poets. Second, by taking elements from the so-called real world outside. And third, by submitting to chance, to the unconscious, to the gods and bats and unicorns that Merrill and David Jackson summoned from the alphabet on the Ouija board. There are many different names for this source of poetry, which is both brand new for Merrill and also something that reaches back to some of the oldest myths of how poetry gets written, such as the Song of Cadman, who dreams his poetry into existence in the eighth century. I say these are stories or myths because with claims about the imagination and with poetry, we're left to tell ourselves these stories about a process that always eludes us and that remains mysterious, unexpected, when it happens again and again. What I'm interested in and what I wanna talk about today is the basis for a book about the way that houses are involved in the processes of poetic creation. And to think about this, I wanna to turn to one of the most persistent kinds of poetry that appears in English, uh, the so-called house poem. When I mentioned this topic initially to a friend over dinner who is an anesthesiologist and just had her third child, was feeling that their house had gotten a bit too small. She said, well, I can understand that. It's a way of talking about families. And she was right. House poems from the British country houses in the 17th century to the apartments and suburban houses in the late 20th, to the foreclosed houses and the houses of the evicted in the early 21st after the financial crisis, 
do talk about families, sometimes in a critical way. And we'll get to that, particular, particularly with James Merrill's hospitable houses. But in the most general sense, we might look and we might begin with the love poem, which is a good place to look when you're looking for a house in poetry. Sometimes the reason why we turn to read a poem instead of a play or a novel is because we want to remind ourselves that the smallest scale of things matters, that the things we say to each other matter, the objects we see and the moments we feel. Novels and poetry are of course made out of the same types of words, but one way they differ is that poetry, at least the shorter kind, is an appeal to our love and our need for intimacy. And the intimacy of poetry flourishes in a domestic interior, like in John Donne's The Sun Rising, which begins, busy old fool, unruly sun, why dost thou thus, through windows and through curtains, call on us? Or we might turn to Adrian Rich's 21 Love Poems, one of my favorite poems from several centuries later, which swaps the alarm for the sun. I wake up in your bed. I know I have been dreaming. Much earlier, the alarm broke us from each other. You've been at your desk for hours. So these are two poems of interiors where the single poem stands in or becomes the entire world for the lovers momentarily and for the readers of the poem. There are also versions of the dawn poem, the obat. Here is done again, and, um, and we have a little slide here, right? Okay, and this is from his poem, The Good Morrow, the middle stanza. And now, good morrow to our waking souls, which watch not one another out of fear, for love, all love of other sights controls and makes one little room and everywhere. Dunn knew exactly what he was doing here with this set of rhyming lines, which we call a stanza after the Italian for room. He uses the constraint of the rhyme to great effect. He rearranges the word order in the syntax so that love, all love, places the subject of the sentence right next to the direct object. It's a neat trick. Love next to love as lover next to lover, subject and object mixed up in the same stanza in the same room. In Dunn, there's also the fiction that this room is that in the house is the whole world. Nothing else is, he says, in a, he writes in a moment of wishful thinking. Already Dunn has moved us from the dramatic scene of a love poem to something more essentially structural. The idea that a poem might not only describe a house, but actually be like a house. Rooms connected by passageways as stanzas are connected to each other by elements of rhyme, rhythm, and repetition. Objects collected and organized together in a way that invites you in. Poetry has often spoken about itself by such analogy to houses. Architectural metaphors are particularly common in English writing poetry, not just Dunn's pretty rooms or Wordsworth's plot of ground, but also Adrian Rich's fact of a door frame. The medieval rhetorician, Geoffrey of Vinceau, even writes about the poetic process as first building a house in the mind, then arranging it on the page with ornaments and figures of speech. I'm gonna linger for just a little bit longer here in the 17th century for a bit before jumping way ahead to Merrill. Uh, it's the period of Shakespeare and of John Milton it's also the period in which something that we know of as the British country house poem gets built. I just wanna to touch down for one moment on one of these really enchanting and elaborate poems. This is a kind of poetry that really only flourished for about 60 years. Uh, and it, it, you know, it was written by a, a handful of poets in the 17th century. Their enchanting verse architecture, their memorable images of bountifulness make for some of the most delightful and accessible reading in this early modern period, which might others, well, otherwise seem a bit alienating and distant. And the reason for that is for these writers of these so-called country house poems, the house stood for, and it propped up much more than just stone and masonry or well. These are very long poems and I'll dip into one of them to draw out some themes that do echo later 
through Merrill. This is Ben Johnson's poem, which addresses Penshurst, the image you see up on the screen. A house built between 1341 and 1349 uh, for Robert and was owned by Robert Sidney, who, uh, who owned the house when Johnson published the poem in 1616. So there's a little quote here from the Johnson poem that I think gives you a sense of what this type of poetry was like. Um, there we go, great. Um, thanks, Bergen. Thou art not, Penser's, built to envious show of touch or marble, nor canst boast a row of polished pillars or a roof of gold. So you can see that there's a bit of a disclaimer here. This is not, Johnson is saying that elaborate, ostentatious houses, although it looks quite elaborate to, to, to our view here, um, uh, the elaborate and ostentatious houses that were in some sense a little bit later borrowed from the Italian architectural style. Um, th this is, a, in Johnson's view, Im important to memorialize because it's a house that doesn't show off its architecture. Instead, it serves a social purpose. And we can see that in the next few lines as Johnson contemplates uh, that role of the house in the community. Uh, go ahead, uh, Bergen, to the next slide. Then hath thy orchard fruit, thy garden flowers, fresh as the air and new as are the hours, the early cherry with the later plum, fig, grape, and quince, each in his time doth come, the blushing apricot and woolly peach hang on thy walls that every child may reach. And though thy walls be of the country stone, they're reared with no man's ruin, no man's groan. There's none that dwell about them wish them down, but all come in, the farmer and the clown. So the academic in me wants to point out that Marxist critics like Raymond Williams have shown how the country house poem excludes certain questions of who built the houses, for instance. Um, but for the purposes of this talk, I want to point more generally to the fact that these poems are not just descriptive. It's not as though we are simply getting a description of masonry, but actually proscriptive. They sort of say how the poet thinks that we should live, or at least how the poet thinks the owner of these great houses should live. There's a 20th century poet, Anthony Hecht, who in his own exploration of this kind of poetry, saw in these houses what he calls the moral emblems of their owners. I think it's an interesting phrase. When we go to James Merrill much later, we find somebody who does resurrect or revitalize, if you wish, certain of these uh, the values that are attached or prescribed through the creation of these poetic houses. And I'm gonna to touch down first on Merrill's epic poem, which is called The Changing Light at Sandover. And then I'll move to some of his most enchanting short poems um, from across his career. Merrill's house happens to be, and this is part of the reason why, um, why uh, the bats in the wallpaper in the other room are, are gonna be important. Merrill's house happens to be an imaginary one, his country house at least. It's the dream house of what he named Sandover, a made up name, but a name overdetermined by literary history, by fantasy, and by his own memories of his childhood bedroom. That house is conjured within the actual walls of two of his very real houses, in Stonington and in Athens, houses that might be seen as, in a way, the moral emblems of their caretakers as well. The houses that do appear directly in Merrill's poems, most notably this house, 107 Water Street, and also his house in, in Athens, Greece, are not necessarily architectural marvels, although there's plenty to marvel at in them. Merrill's houses, at least the ones of his adult life, are fitted to the life that he wished to live in them and to the poems that he wrote in them. Although the orchard in Southampton, his childhood home, looms very largely over Merrill's psyche, the vast majority of his poetic houses are distinguished more by their eclecticism than by their grandeur. You can get a glimpse of that behind me here. They're more remarkable for what they let in than for who they keep out. As Langenhammer writes in his biography of Merrill, it was natural for Merrill to think of his poems as a kind of house because his house was a kind of poem. By the time that James Merrill and David Jackson moved into this house at 107 Water Street, they had already begun their Ouija board sessions that would be bookmarked narratively by changes to this house where they lived. 
And in the second section of the Book of Ephraim, a long poem that was included in the book that Merrill called, after Dante, but with a little bit of a wry twist, Divine Comedies, 107 Water Street takes the place as the setting. What you need to know really only is that this book is organized into 26 chapters, one for each letter of the alphabet. And so here's section B, and I'll just read a couple parts from it. Backdrop. The dining room at Stonington. Walls of ready mixed matte flame. A witty shade, now watermelon, now sunburn. Overhead, a turn of the century dome, expressing white tin wreaths and fleur-de-lis in palpable relief to candlelight. Time is marked in the poem by the house, its renovations in particular, and the place that Merrill and Jackson take up in the community. 1955 this would have been, second summer of our tenancy. Another year we'd buy the old eyesore, half of whose top story we now rented. Build above that a glass room off a wooden star deck, put a fireplace in, make friends. Now strangers to the village, did we even have a telephone? Who needed one? We had each other for communication and all the rest. The stage was set for Ephraim. Uh, charmingly, the next book that he wrote, The Mirabal, Books of Number, begins about 20 years later with the age of the wrong wallpaper, which, buckling and peeling into hallucinatory shapes, briefly drives the two out of the house and out of their minds. The most memorable for some who have stayed here detail of the Merrill apartment is visible right to my left shoulder, and that is blue bat wallpaper. That was made a little bit later after the section I read, and it's modeled after the bats on a rug that David Jackson brought back from Boston. There are these friendly satanic bats in the story of the poem uh, that seem to model themselves in turn on the wallpaper. And the point here is that the house provides inspiration for the poem. The poem prompts renovations of the house, such as the repainting of the flame walls most recently done. In the final section of The Changing Light at Sandover, which I want to briefly um, show you a piece of, uh, Merrill's friends and poetic influences convene. There's W.H. Auden and T.S. Eliot, but also his dead friends Hans and Mimi. The cosmic epic takes on the intimate feel as Hammer writes of a family album. In the final scene, Merrill compares the imaginary Sandover to the great manorial houses of the past, the ones that I, that I briefly alluded to. Great room, I know you. Somewhere on earth I've met you in disguise, scouted your dark English woods and blood red hangings and glared down the bison head above a hearth of stony heraldry. How many years before your restoration brought to light this foreign youthful grace. But echoing the poets of those great houses, he turns against that monumental style, in other words, the ostentatiousness for its own sake. And he says, for affection's poorest objects, set in perfect light by, happen by happenstance. Whoops, please go to the next slide, Bergen. For affection's poorest object, set in perfect light by happenstance, grows irreplaceable. And whether in time a room or a romance fails us or redeems us, will have followed as an extension of our feel for, call them, immaterials. Here, at least, is a grand house to compete with the country house poems, but it's also, in its way, an occupation and a transfer of title. Freed from the legacy of the house of Charles Merrill, of Merrill Lynch, not bearing children, not marrying, or otherwise carrying on a line, Merrill takes over the house for other purposes. He invites a family not of kin, but a poetic kind, a gathering of his own affections, poorest objects, set in the perfect light of his poetic artistry. So I want to move uh, quickly on here because I've lingered with these poems uh, to, um, to a couple moments in which Merrill actually explicitly draws a connection between the houses and the process of writing poetry itself. Um, and this is not so much me offering an interpretation as responding to some of the things Merrill himself says in his house poems. The most famous being the broken home, 
where Merrill, as a child on the upper story of his house, refers to the unstiflement of the entire story of his parents' divorce. Or in An Urban Convalescence, the poem that starts off his collection, Water Street, Merrill writes, as he watches a building being torn down in New York, that the massive volume of the world closes again. So these are puns, and Merrill, who's so fond of wordplay, volume means both capacity and, of course, a written collection, and story, which means both the upper level and a narrative, help him show the connection his poems make between writing about a house and writing about his life. And it's true that when we read Merrill's poems about houses, what we get are the moments in which he decides, I figured out how to write about my life as a poet. His earlier poems, um, while beautiful, did not refer explicitly to say events or people in his life. Unsurprisingly, oh, well, we can also look at, before going to uh, the next poem, at a passage from some of Merrill's prose, in which he compares moving through a poem to moving through a house. I'll just uh, look very briefly at a sentence here. Um, Bergen, if you could put up the, the longish passage, um, the next slide, actually. Fantastic, thank you. So, interior spaces, he writes, the shape and correlation of rooms in a house have always appealed for me to me. Trying for a blank mind, I catch myself instead revisiting a childhood bedroom on Long Island. If you go down a few sentences, you'll see this fondness for given arrangements might explain how instinctively I took to quatrains, those are four line stanzas, to octaves and sestets, those are the parts of the sonnet, when I began to write poems. The house we can see in Merrill has been such an enduring theme for poetry and an enduring metaphor for poetic creation because it suggests two somewhat contradictory things at once. The first is that writing a poem means coming to terms with and inhabiting the given arrangements that exist before you sit down to write. Those are the books in his study, for instance. The second is that poems can play an active role when moving between one of those rooms and, one of the, and, and another one, one stanza and the next, in bringing things together that have been sundered and broken or torn apart in the life lived. So there's both a sense of being subject to the existing order of things and being able to renovate it. And that's, that's one way of thinking about how poems interact with history, with poetic history in general. I'm going to turn to an early poem that takes place in one of Merrill's houses now. And this is a poem that may be unfamiliar um, even to fans of Merrill. It's a beautiful poem called Three Chores. And it's from his 1959 collection, The Country of a Thousand Years of Peace. Of daily soil laving, fabric of all and sundry, with no time for believing, loving might work the wonder. Who among clouded linen has scattered bluing then, well over wrist in grieving, dismissed all but the doing? May see to clothes lines later, a week of swans depending, from wooden beaks take flight, flapping at dawn from waters, jewel of the first water, and every dismal matter's absorption in its cleansing, bring the new day to light. This, this poem, which has been stuck in my head for 20 years, um, takes a quotidian household event, laundry, and transforms it into four poetic, four line stanzas with rhymes and echoes of sound. In doing so, Merrill activates and brings together, again, that thing that he thinks poetry might be able to do, all the rich and diverse history of the English language. Just for an example here, the first phrase of daily soil you're laving is definitely a kind of crazy way of describing the wash, but the word daily with its old English roots flaps on the line alongside soil and laving, which bring their French inheritance into the poem. On the level of the rhyme, you might look at the last two stanzas. Here, later rhymes with water, depending with cleansing, flight with light, and waters with matters. Instead of just filling a single room, the rhymes make a passageway between the two stanza. 
I'm stretching the idea of the house poem here to include the activities that take place in the house, which tempted Merrill's imagination to deploy some of his most virtuosic skills with sound and with pattern, two of the most wonderful reasons to read poetry at all. But let's look at a poem that is a, is a, is a kind of, a, let's see, greatest hit of Merrill that really does take place in, in a house and thinks about the relation between the interior and the exterior of the house. And that's days of 1964. Begins with the description of Merrill's house in Athens. Houses, an embassy, the hospital. Our neighborhood sun cured, if trembling, still in pools of the night's rain. Across the street that led to the center of town, a steep hill kept one company part way, or could be climbed in 20 minutes for some literally breathtaking views framed by umbrella pines of city and sea. Underfoot, cyclamen, autumn crocus grew spangled as with fine sweat among the relics of good times had by all if not Olympus, an out of earshot, year round, hillside, revel. The poem goes on to incorporate a character, Cleo, a real person, their neighbor and house cleaner, who appears in many of Merrill's poems. And it also has a scene of Merrill and his lover in bed. In that scene, Merrill says, love makes one generous, reflecting on his relationships. But then two moments of uneasiness occur outside the house. Merrill thinks he spots Cleo walking up the hill as a prostitute or a sex worker. He finds himself in an outdoor market full of hagglers. Was love illusion, he asks, in concern. Inside the house, love, laughter, generosity. Outside the house, necessity, commerce, the fear of being taken advantage of, or worse, violence. The poem's own architecture develops the theme. A reader passes through stanzas of 12, 12, and five lines, 14, 12, and five lines, and a final stanza of 14 lines. And those of you who remember that the sonnet has 14 lines might think it's exerting its hidden presence here, and it could be felt perhaps throughout the poem, or at least hinted at, separated by these five line stanzas of reflective self-knowledge that mirror each other. One of these is a statement of generosity, the other is a request for generosity, for forgiveness, and I'll read that. Forgive me if you read this, and may carry a Cleo, should someone ever put it into Greek, forgive me too. I had gone so long without loving, I hardly knew what I was thinking. Finally, we return to the interior of the house, but in the terms that Merrill had used, perhaps to describe the outside earlier, where I hid my face, your touch, quick, merciful, blindfolded me. A god breathed from my lips. If that was illusion, I wanted it to last long, to dwell for its daily pittance with us there, cleaning and watering, sighing with love or pain. I hoped that it would climb when it needed, to even the heights of degradation, sorry, to the heights even of degradation as I, for one, seemed those days to be always climbing into a world of wild flowers, feasting, tears, or was I falling, legs buckling, heights, depths, into a pool of each night's rain? But you were everywhere beside me, masked as who was not, in laughter, pain, and love. The poem almost ends with a prayer that illusion and that self-transformation would continue that they would last long. And in fact, the phrase and love does extend beyond the rhymes of rain and pain. In the poem, at least, love does go on a little longer. So the interior of the house for Merrill is a place of illusion, of transformation, of renewal, of play and creativity. And these are set against, in a way, permanence and stability. The implications are, to borrow a phrase from a poet who admired Merrill, Agasha Hidali, that, quote, rooms are never finished. The renovations ongoing, the revisions never ending. So in the comic version of this theme from the book of Ephraim, Marilyn Jackson wait endlessly for the furnace to be fixed 
at 107 Water Street. Can the life, like the poem, be renovated? Can it be remade? Can the self be transformed? Marcel Proust and his Search for Lost Time, written across a long seven volume novel, was one of Merrill's most beloved authors and one of his most beloved themes. But hidden here in his house poems is also a strain of Charles Dickens, whose novels Merrill was reading just as he began to write the long narrative poems of his mid-career. The characters in Dickens struggle always to be the heroes of their own stories as Merrill himself pushed to be more than the son of Charles Merrill, and in the process to reinvent their lives beyond inherited conditions. I don't have time in this talk to explore some of the many other developments the house poem takes on as a metaphor for poetic creation. Some might think of Gwendolyn Brooks's kitchenette in Chicago in the 1940s, or Adrian Rich's snapshots of a daughter-in-law. In both the house's materials, are much less easy to use for making poetry. The writer comes up against their historical exclusion from poetry's given arrangements, or their participation, unwilling in some cases, in reinforcing inhospitable norms that might trap them inside. These themes continue into contemporary house poems I'd recommend to you by the poets Nikki Walshleger and Jennifer S. Cheng. Merrill's poems speak not only with the bittersweet nostalgia of making a house out of the life lived, out of the love spent, two lines from an urban convalescence, but they also speak with the belief that poetry can do more than recover what has been lost in translation, more than repair the broken home. Like a series of exquisite variations upon the old adage, you can never go home again, Merrill's poems return to the sites of their own foundations to elegize the past, certainly, but also to make new plans for the future. Like one of his friends, the great poet Elizabeth Bishop, Merrill encourages us to see things again, to pay attention to echoes of sound, to listen for rhymes and for wordplay, and in general, to let ourselves roam around in the cluttered rooms of his poetry's houses, as I have here. The ever-renewing power of the imagination finds its home in his homes and in his poems about them. There is a moral here at one remove, and it is to avoid the incrustations of the heart that come from prejudice and from settled thinking. From a metaphor for the origins of how a poem gets made, Merrill's open houses invite us to reimagine our lives. I'll read just um, one brief poem that I wrote in, in the house here, uh, and then I'll turn um, over to Willard, who has some questions, I'm sure. This poem, which was written up on the star deck that we looked at before, is the end of a long poem called The Ratings Period. And it was, I've been tinkering with it all, all day yesterday, so you're getting something that's kind of like fresh out of the oven, so please uh, have some forbearance in your criticism. Our seasonal thermometer, the mask, wobbles, gauging the time of year by the cooling seawater. While at three and four, the foghorn follows, leading off the intervals of the dawn's revival. Dozing half awake, I go back to the house on Wynwood Road, where the fire bell's crouch still waits in the closet. Something else comes back. It's days before we moved out. As a teenage prank or genuine theft, someone breaks in. My sister comes downstairs and surprises him. He sees her, panics, escapes with a copy of my Penguin edition of Les Mis. She stands in her flannel, silent. Now it's late in the day for another image. I don't know how to finish this. Through the bay window of the lower limbs, the tree we climbed are gone. The, through the bay window, the lower limbs of the tree we climbed are gone. Our parents, ready for the worst, emergencies to come, couldn't understand what hurt. The sun comes out to relieve me. Nothing left was taken. And at the back of the house, in a stone well, half fallen into dust and mold, the light is still escaping. Thanks. Thanks.
Walt, that was yeah. that was wonderful, uh, both provocative and silence-inducing with gratitude. Um, I can ask some questions. I hope that um, the function here, the chat function, will work so that people in the audience can also um, ask questions. I see someone has sent something already. Let me ask you something. Um, I never saw the house in Athens, but I've seen 107 Water Street, and I saw Merrill's apartment in New York, which was his grandmother's apartment, and I also saw his house in Key West, which he had for the last 10 years of his life. And one thing occurred to me there, and it's relevant to both the man and the work. Merrill had the money, if he had the inclination, to build a house, any kind of house he wanted, but he never did. He always wanted to take an existing structure and to make it his own. 107 Water Street is this little rabbit warren of undistinguished rooms, uh, but he took it and made it personal. The house in Athens, I've been told, is exactly the same kind of thing. There's nothing grand about it at all. And that was also true of the house in Key West. And this says something interesting to me about the man, but also about his way of being a poet. Uh, he would take forms that he inherited and work with them to do or make different kinds of arrangements. One question that comes to mind is, not so much about Merrill, but about some of the other poets you think about. Are there poets who actually constructed houses that they then wrote about? Mm. And does the construction of a house say anything about the construction of new poetic forms, not ones they inherited or revived or revised, but ones they invented themselves? This is putting a lot on your plate. No, thank you. You know, you. I. I think that you've extended the um, the question of given arrangements into really interesting um, territory. I. I think immediately of a poem from the end of Adrian Rich's Snapshots of a daughter-in-law called the Roof Walkers. This is the place where I would go. I think for this question. Here she is, actually watching her house or a house next door. It's a little unclear. Mm -hmm. uh, be be constructed, and she thinks, I am like one of these roof walkers, I am constructing a house. Now for her, she's coming to terms with raising three children. This is 1963 when she publishes the volume. Um, she's still married, uh, I think. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, at that moment though, Willard, this is the, this is the uh, part that answers your question. At that moment, um, she, uh, she also moves away from the formalism of her first couple books and and creates this sort of a you know collection of fragments um, which if not a new form at least shows the impulse to generate a new form through the materials mm -hmm. uh, you know through the materials of, uh, through the possible materials of its construction um, so that might be one place to go um, the uh, oh good it's come back on the screen uh, Bridget Trogdon writes, I was a bit thrown by the friendly satanic bats. Who wasn't? Every, everyone who has read, yes, everyone was thrown by them. Could you elaborate on that a bit? Can you help? Yeah, so so Bridget, um, one of the ways that, uh, thank, thanks for being here, Bridget. One of the ways that, uh, it, that Merrill calls back the memory of uh, a poem you probably know, Paradise Lost by John Milton is to replace the angels in a way who have fallen from grace um, with something a bit campier and more fun. And that uh, he takes from the patterning of his rug and that, that's a series of bats who talk to him through the Ouija board. Um, I could go further you know, and tell you how they also become unicorns and the Archangel Gabriel and things like that, but that's getting into the weeds perhaps or into the stars as it were. Um, so, uh, so the bats, in other words, are characters in the poem, uh, which he's, to, to whom he speaks through the uh, mirror that you can barely glimpse on stage. Now, of course, this elaborate device is a way both for Merrill to say, I like to read older poems, I draw from them, and also I'm not going to, you know, sort of throw you under the bus of my knowledge of those older poems. I'm going to make it more fun uh, uh, for, for you to read. So that's why those bats, that's why I said friendly satanic bats. I'm not, you know, uh, 
they're they're quite literally drawing back on the uh, on on that history of Milton. Mm -hmm. Uh, Peter Hooten, writing, I assume, from Florida, uh, reminds us that the bats are also radioactive. Yes, thank you. Related to radioactivity was one of the themes of the epic. And that does put that does um, point to one of the reasons why, if you're not that interested in epic poetry, you might still give The Changing Light at Sandover a bit of a look. It is one of the few poems from the period that, in an extended way, tackles head on the, the impending nuclear catastrophes of the 60s as it's being generated. Well, so, it's also interesting to me that uh, bats are crazy. You know, you're bats in the belfry. For sure. He was certainly aware of the fact that he could be accused of all kinds of uh, insanity. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And he, then, uh, Christopher Spade writes in, yes, quite rightly, Robinson Jeffers built his own home. Uh, on the West Coast, uh, rather than the East Coast, on whose floors he stomped his feet to count beats in his poems. Didn't know that, Chris, but I'm going to try that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, not in this one, not in this house, but that's really helpful. You know, one of the things about this topic is that um, uh, talking to people about it generates just such a wealth of knowledge about different kinds of house poems. Um, and well, I think the, uh, Yates comes to mind, of course. Uh, and he had tour Ballet, but all the other interior spaces. And Merrill was very uh, interested in the way Yeats built it. And it was also interested in the uh, crazy stuff that uh, Merrill was interested in, too. That's right. And, um, and, and Seamus Heaney has a wonderful essay where he compares Yeats's stanza forms to, uh, t to a tower themselves, a kind of tower in the ear. To and a stanza is a room, by definition. Right. Somebody just wrote on, uh, and I can't remember what she said it was about. Yes, the bat turns into a peacock. That's exactly right. So throughout the epic, there are all kinds of transformations, and the bat does become a peacock. It's not just bats in the belfry. It's bats being metamorphosed into glorious, glorious uh, birds. Uh, Gustav Mons writes, what is the least expected book? Oh, this is good. You've spotted right and pulled from the shelves. Are you discovering notes Merrill left in others? I think those have all been taken away, haven't they? There are some inscriptions. I was saying to Willard yesterday that Fegel's inscribed a copy of the Iliad of the Odyssey to Merrill, I found, the, the great translator of the, of the Iliad and the Odyssey. Um, but um, to, uh, let's see, to answer that question, um, m many, um, but I think the one that had an effect on me because he, um, because it's a poet, with whom he didn't share much affinity. And that is, I mentioned him earlier, the, the Greek poet, uh, George Seferis, who, who I mean, I think met once, um, but who writes a, um, a kind of, writes with a kind of grandeur that I think Merrill uh, had some skepticism about. And I found a book of his called Three Secret Poems. Uh, I also found a book by, um, by a contemporary Greek poet um, um, whom I hadn't seen outside of Athens. So to, to, to give you a kind of, sense of where my interest was directed, um, there are a lot of copies of not, val not they're not worth anything, but um, uh, contemporary Greek poetry in here. Uh, and I, I was sort of fascinated to, to pull those off the shelves and read them uh, and discover um, some new poets uh, that way. So that's, that's one answer. One, one reason I know that uh, Merrill, when he got out of the army and left the States, went to Greece rather than as many American poets and young artists did to France or Italy, was that he wanted to go to a place, first of all, where there wouldn't be other Americans. Mm. And after he had gone, he went there after spending two years in Rome, uh, two or three years in Rome. He wanted to go where there weren't other Americans and where he could learn a new language, which he didn't know. Right. So he could sort of make, well, make a new life for himself in a new place and in a new language, uh, thereby remaking his life and starting out as being a kind of child. Yeah. Uh, because he had to learn a language, which he did, and learned it fluently. Uh, but it was doing a very daring thing for somebody uh, 75 years ago. Yes, and I think in the same way that Merrill would rely on a dictionary, on a rhyming dictionary, to... Um, to say make English less familiar to him and to broaden the possibilities for his poetry. So too, I suspect, and I, I would imagine others have worked um, on this question. Um, so too, I suspect 
alienated himself from English by learning Greek at, in middle age really, or early middle age, um, you know, must have had a, a, a direct impact on his style or his syntax or his rhyme or something, um, mm -hmm. or perhaps the collection of sounds he, he uh, assembled. He, he liked the idea that he had such, there was a, a very childlike part of his character. And I think he liked the idea of being a, a young man yeah. being reduced to a kind of, I don't want to say infantile status, but right. he had to learn a new language, which meant that uh, you have to throw yourself into it with abandon and with carelessness and with unthinkingness and not being able to plot one move after another. You have to be willing to make mistakes in order to make a new home for yourself linguistically in that new language. There's an anecdote that came to mind. It's not about Merrill, but it's about David Jackson. And I, I hope I don't get it wrong, but it's from the biography. And um, it involves David Jackson looking for his um, eyeglasses uh, or his, his glasses under a bar table and saying, where is my grandmother? Where is my grandmother? Because apparently the words were uh, yaya and the word for eyeglasses were similar, I suppose. So that, That's right. Yeah. We, we have a question here uh, from Tehran, uh, is lyric poetry the only genre that he excelled at? Of course, the answer is no, but uh, that's the one for which I think he is most and will be best remembered for a long time. I don't know what your feeling is about that. I, I agree, and I, I um, my preference is for his shorter lyrics, although I know many like to dive into the epic, but he also um, wrote a novel that, uh, two novels, but one that was really um, celebrated, uh, The Diblos Notebook, which was sort of a, experimental novel um, uh, in the, um, oh gosh, late 60s maybe it was published. Um, so he was he was a novelist and thought of himself. And he wrote some plays that had um, that had some runs, um, were not ultimately that successful. Um, and then prose, uh, essays, uh, he wrote in a memoir. So um, he tried his hand at, at a lot of literary genres. Um, I think, you know, and one can drift through them and see what one prefers. I, I tend to like the... The, the musical lyrics myself. I think that's the general consensus. Uh, one of my colleagues has been asking you uh, about your residency experience here. Is there a value in such a writing residency? Can you comment very briefly about that? And we'll go back to the literature in a moment. Of course, yes. I, I think that there is, um, there's nothing like this, there's nothing like having a residency. There's nothing like this particular residency it is unique because you are isolated in the house and can write. It is unique because when you step out the door, the town of Stonington, um, uh, with all COVID restrictions uh, obeyed and in place, uh, has been a very, very welcoming uh, community as well. Are there any other questions from people out there in the ethernet? I feel that we're doing Merrill a kind of uh, homage by receiving uh, messages from the other world. Okay, let me thank you for this, Walt. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you so much, Willard. I really enjoyed it. And I, I suggest to everybody uh, out there, go to the James Merrill uh, website and you'll see what is upcoming. Uh, you can also support our work at jamesmerrillhouse.org slash donate. But you can also see who's coming next. I believe our next event is with Carl Phillips in, in, in two weeks, the great American poet living in St. Louis. So uh, stay tuned, log in, don't uh, drop acid, and don't drop out. But we'll see you next time. Thanks. Bye. Thanks.